Good morning, CPC. Welcome to worship on this fifth Sunday of Easter and Communion Sunday. I'm happy that you've decided to join us for this online service today. And please note, we are now counting down on our pre-recorded online services. Counting this one, there are only five left. After that, starting in June, our services will be in person and live streamed which is very exciting. And you'll be hearing more about this in upcoming announcements. But for now, I want to offer special thanks to my friend behind the camera, Tim Hookstra. Feel free to clap for Tim right now where you're sitting. By the end of May, Tim and I will have pre-recorded over 50 online sermons. And on top of that, for Tim anyway, has been all the compiling and editing and additional recordings. Tim, you are a tech warrior. Thank you very much. Now, in addition, we will have one in-person service in the month of May, and that's two weeks from now on May 16th. So please remember to RSVP for that in-person worship service to Katie, the church office, and remember to wear a mask. And now please join me in prayer. Growth causing God, be with us today by your spirit and remind us that we are always on this journey with you. When we think that we have arrived is when we need to step back and ask ourselves what else needs to be done in order to move forward. For we know with you that there is always another insight to be gained always another river to cross, always another wall to be broken down so that your love might be experienced, so that your grace might be administered, so that your justice might be done to all. We pray this in the name of the vine, Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> Hello friends, thank you for joining me for another book break. The book that I have chosen to share with you today is called When I Was Young in the Mountains, and it was written by Cynthia Ryland and illustrated by Diane Good. When I Was Young in the Mountains. When I was young in the mountains, grandfather came home in the evening covered with the black dust of a coal mine. 
Only his lips were clean, and he used them to kiss the top of my head. When I was young in the mountains, grandmother spread the table with hot cornbread, pinto beans, and fried okra. Later, in the middle of the night, she walked through the grass with me to the Johnny house and held my hand in the dark. I promised never to eat more than one serving of okra again. When I was young in the mountains, we walked across the cow pasture and through the woods carrying our towels. The swimming hole was dark and muddy, and we sometimes saw snakes, and we jumped in anyway. On our way home, we stopped at Mr. Crawford's for a mound of white butter. Mr. Crawford and Mrs. Crawford looked alike and always smelled of sweet milk. When I was young in the mountains, we pumped pails of water from the well at the bottom of the hill and heated the water to fill round tin tubs for our baths. Afterward, we stood in front of the old black stove, shivering and giggling, while Grandmother heated cocoa on top. When I was young in the mountains, we went to church in the schoolhouse on Sundays, and sometimes walked with the congregation through the cow pasture to the dark swimming hole for baptisms. My cousin Peter was laid back into the water and his white shirt stuck to him and my grandmother cried. When I was young in the mountains, we listened to frogs sing at dusk and awoke to cowbells outside our windows. Sometimes a black snake came in the yard and my grandmother would threaten it with a hoe. If it did not leave, she used the hoe to kill it. Four of us once draped a very long snake, dead, of course, across our necks for a photograph. When I was young in the mountains, we sat on the porch swing in the evenings, and Grandfather sharpened my pencils with his pocket knife. Grandmother sometimes shelled beans and sometimes braided my hair. The day the dogs lay around us and the stars sparkled in the sky. A bob white whistled in the forest. Bob, bob, bob white. When I was young in the mountains, I never wanted to go to the ocean. And I never wanted to go to the desert. I never wanted to go anywhere else in the world. For I was in the mountains. And that was always enough. The end. So friends, I wonder what special things about where you live you would tell stories about to other people. So the author of this book was talking about where she grew up in the mountains and all of the special experiences that she had there, the food that she ate and where she went swimming and the shops that she would visit and the church that she attended. And those were all important things about where she lived that, that made it special for her, made it a place she wanted to be. So I wonder what things you find special about where you live. If there's a special place you like to go, a special uh, food you like to eat, restaurant you like to go to, maybe there are fun activities at church uh, that you would tell other people about as a reason why you're happy right where you are. Uh, you know, a lot of us have been right where we are for quite a while because of COVID. And I think that we've come to appreciate where we are since we can't travel anyplace else. We've had to kind of rediscover new exciting things about our home and here in Ames and, um, you know, here in the state of Iowa. Uh, and Jesus had similar experiences, you know, he told a lot of stories to his disciples to teach them lessons about God, and he often used 
uh, things that they knew about from their home, uh, there where the disciples and Jesus came from in their part of the world. You know, he used things they were familiar with in his stories and his parables to help teach them uh, lessons for their lives. Uh, so friends, I hope that you can look around and think about some fun things for where you live uh, that would make you never want to leave. And I hope you enjoyed this story. And I hope to see you again next week for another one. Thank you for joining me, friends. Goodbye. Our scripture reading for this morning comes to us from the Gospel according to John. We're in chapter 15, reading verses 1 through 8. Jesus is speaking to his disciples. Listen for a word from the Lord. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. God removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, God prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I've spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me, you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Listen for what the Spirit is saying to us. Last Sunday morning, during the Zoom fellowship time, we talked about the Bible and about the various translations that are out there. And I was reminded of the humorous references to life that one can find in the pages of Scripture if one is interested in puns and word plays. There are the references to sports in the Bible. Tennis, Joseph served, in Pharaoh's court. Baseball, in the beginning. There is the reference to the world's shortest man. No, not Zacchaeus, who could not see Jesus for the crowd, but rather, Nehemiah. <laughs> and finally, there is the claim that a dozen people can fit into a Honda automobile. The disciples were all in one accord. I know, I know, pretty silly. Yet, when it comes to Jesus, we are usually all pretty serious. Jesus is God in the flesh. He is divine. As a friend of mine likes to remind me, though, he is divine. We are the branches. And that's exactly what we're talking about today. The divine vine the one by whom we grow and from whom we obtain our religious orientation and our spiritual nourishment. I may have told you that my very first paying job as a high schooler was working in the watermelon fields in Central California, just outside Bakersfield. My football coach had gotten the summer job for me and some of my teammates to toughen us up and teach us some endurance. It was hard work. We would arrive at the fields at 4.30 in the morning in order to get started before the intense 100 degree plus heat began to melt your brain and sap your enthusiasm. During the lunch hour each day, we would huddle in the shade of the watermelon truck and ingest salt tablets along with our sandwiches and water so as not to dehydrate as the afternoon wore on. We would work until 4.30 in the afternoon and then 
call it quits. Eleven hours in the dust and the heat each day. I never labored so hard in my life. And here's how it worked. Before we could even line them up in a row on the ground and begin handing our watermelons to the person next to us, and then that guy would hand it to the next person next to him in line, and so on until they were all finally handed up into the bed of the truck and neatly stacked there. Before any of that could happen, the cutters would come through the fields. We could see them out in front of us, 40, 50 yards away. Each of them wielded an incredibly sharp knife. They would bend over at the waist and quick as a whistle, slice in two the vine connecting the watermelon to the ground. And they tried to cut it as close as possible to the watermelon itself because nobody wanted a long vine hanging off the melon to get tangled up in or to trip upon. And you know, coming from the city, as I had, that was the very first time I ever considered the life that the vine brought to the produce. If that life-giving cord was cut too soon, the fruit would not develop, and it would spoil. Indeed, there were times when one of the watermelons that had been severed from its vine was missed by those of us who were following after the cutters. It was hidden in the weeds, or perhaps it was a little too small to see. In those cases, of course, the melon would dry out under the intense summer heat, and eventually it would rot. It was no good for anything except perhaps to throw at your friend when you happened upon it the next day when we got to the fields. And that realization about the vine made me appreciate today's scripture passage even more. Because it's easy to get cut off from Jesus, even to cut ourselves off from him at times. The world offers so many tempting distractions and alternatives. And we may end up saying to ourselves, I don't want to be tied to this vine forever, do I? No, I, I want to instead roll around out there with the free people testing the limits and sometimes taking some chances. Why should I always stay connected to God? Why should we? I mean, we can always reconnect whenever we want to, right? But that's not how life-giving sources work. No, you've got to stay connected if you hope to thrive. And let's face it, oftentimes we need that daily nourishment to survive. And that, my friends, seems to be what Jesus is talking about in the Gospel according to John. He not only says that we need to abide in his life, and that word abide, of course, means to remain in close fellowship with, to stay in close contact with. Jesus not only makes that clear, that we need to abide in his life, he also emphasizes that the vine dresser, the creator in heaven, will cut us even if we do abide in Jesus. And the word that Jesus uses for this so-called cutting is pruning. The vine grower will prune us if it means that we'll be able to produce more fruit. More fruit. Now, I don't know about you, but I didn't think God was into numbers, into volume, into quantity. I was always taught that God was into quality alone. Well, not according to Jesus. You see, there is so much need in the world right now. There is so much hunger, physically and spiritually. There is so much depression and desperation out there today that the amount of fruit that God's people need to produce today is perhaps greater than it's ever been. And unless we consent and agree to God pruning us when necessary, then our net effect on the world 
will be negligible. And God forbid, may not even be noticeable. That's not what God wants. And neither should we. No. We've got to think big because we serve a big God. And again, that may not be what we've learned. I mean, we've been told, throw one starfish back into the ocean. That's enough. That's all you need to do. But my siblings in Christ, as noble as that is, when the climate is changing all around us and the ecosystem is deteriorating rapidly in our world because of our actions and our subsequent inaction, we cannot only do our little part. Not only. We've also got to join together to do our big part. All of us. And that joining in community may be hard for some of us because we've been taught our entire lives to be independent and not necessarily collaborative. We've been trained from day one to be individualistic, not primarily community-minded or even other-directed. And this is true even in the church. But God wants to prune us now. To cut us back from our fierce individualism. So as to allow us to grow some more. That's God's plan. Yet God won't proceed without our say-so. That's right. You see, if we're trying to fend off all that pruning that God's attempting to do, well, the vine dresser may just allow us and our stubborn free will to do so. And even if God persists in the pruning, as much as we don't like it, we won't be useful to God if we're not amenable to what God is accomplishing in us. For you see, that's the rub about being a Christian. It's not a one-time transformation. It's an ongoing change of heart and mind. That's why Jesus says in our reading, My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. That you become my disciples. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but the disciples had already been with Jesus for a long time when he says this to them. It was quite a way into Jesus' ministry when he makes this statement to the twelve. What did Jesus mean? Bear much fruit and become my disciples. Weren't they already his followers? Yes and no. For you see, in the Christian life, our discipleship is only as good as our following is of Jesus today. Let me say that again. Our discipleship is only as good as is our following of Jesus today. Today. Now, that's not how we may follow him tomorrow. It's not about how we may have successfully followed Jesus in the past. Today is the day of salvation, says the scriptures. And that's not just for those who've never been saved. That's for all of us who need to continue to be made whole and complete and filled and full. It's for us. Today is the day with challenges. Today is the day with troubles. Today is the day with opportunities. Are we following Jesus today, you and me? That's the only question that really matters. Back in the mid-1990s, like just about everybody else in the world at that time, I suppose, I was a huge Michael Jordan Chicago Bulls basketball fan. I figured if my L.A. Lakers couldn't win, and they weren't winning, then I would cheer for the Bulls, along with the rest of the nation. That era was chronicled recently in The Last Dance, a documentary on Jordan and the Bulls 
that came out near the beginning of the COVID-19 shutdown. In it, Phil Jackson, the then coach of the Bulls and a pastor's kid, as it happens, said to his players, success is defined by being successful. Not by having been successful and not by the prospect of being successful. You must perform every day. You must become successful. And frankly, Jesus is saying something similar here to his disciples. You must become my disciples, he says to his disciples. Right now, every day. For it's not a title to wield. It's an identity to develop. It's ongoing. Because, he says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Not something, not a little bit, nothing. So allow me to ask, what needs to be done in our world today? What needs to be accomplished on this planet as we speak? so many things. There's a health emergency, a COVID crisis right now in India. You've heard about it. What can we do? Can we send money? Yes. Through the wonders of the internet, our resources can be shared. Can we lobby our state and national leaders to send equipment there? Ventilators, masks, needles. Yes, we can do that. What else? There's also a climate crisis going on worldwide. What can we do? We can be as individually resourceful as possible. Yes, but think bigger. We can help fund research into the effects of carbon-based fuels on our environment. We can boycott products and initiatives that ignore the science of global warming and dismiss the reality of fragile ecosystems. We can do those things. We can speak out when it's time to speak out. We can act when it's time to act. We must. And the list of concerns and problems on this planet is innumerable. There's always something to do if we are continually educating ourselves and constantly willing to meet needs. There'll never be a lack of things for us to find to do. I ask further then, are these things part of our discipleship to Jesus Christ? For let's admit it, Jesus didn't know about global warming. He didn't know what a coronavirus or what the other ribonucleic acid viruses are. Jesus didn't know the phrase Black Lives Matter or that the 14th Amendment to our Constitution promises equal protection under the law for all persons. In addition, he probably never even thought of sexual orientation as a category or of domestic gun violence as a phenomenon. No, if he was not exposed to these things, how can we say that following him today may involve addressing some or all of these important issues? I think you know the answer. It has to do with abiding in the character of Christ. After all, he cured the lepers, didn't he? He fed the hungry. He defended and helped the marginalized. He honored the creation. And he said, if you abide in me and my words or my message abide in you, Then ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Now, I don't need to tell you that Jesus is not acting the genie here, promising to grant us any material need or possession that we desire. No, let's not be ridiculous. Our Lord is instead guaranteeing to us that whenever we are determined to do something in his name, in the name of compassion, in the name of justice, and with commitment, individually and corporately, 
that it will ultimately be accomplished. Nothing will be able to stop it. Think of that. Nothing. Not armies, not prejudice or discrimination, no matter how strong or entrenched it is. Not the blazing heat of the day or the violent cold of the night. Nothing can stop Jesus' love from being demonstrated through his disciples. In fact, the only thing that can interrupt God's progress is our unwillingness, our apathy. That's it. That's the only thing. For remember, just as the branch cannot bear fruit apart from the vine, Jesus says, neither can you bear fruit apart from me. Will we hinder God's plan or will we help it along? And even if we haven't always done so from the beginning, will we serve in Jesus' court? My friends, will we abide in the divine vine? Are we becoming his disciples? Amen. Oh, shame is a prison as cruel as a grave. Shame is a robber and he's come to take my name. Love is my redeemer lifting me up from the ground. Love is the power where my freedom song is found. There ain't no grave. Gonna hold my body down There ain't no grave Gonna hold my body down When I hear that trumpet sound I'm gonna rise up out of the ground oh, There ain't no grave Gonna hold my body down Oh, fear is a liar With a smooth and velvet tongue Fear is a tyrant Always telling me to run Love is a resurrection Love a trumpet sound Love is my weapon I'm gonna take my giants down Ain't no grave Gonna hold my body down There ain't no grave Gonna hold my body down When I hear that trumpet sound I'm gonna rise up out of the There ain't no grave Gonna hold my body down between death and life and there on a tree the Lamb of God was crucified and he went on down to hell he took back every key he rose up as a lion and he set all captives free yeah he set all captives free there ain't no grave 
put his body down There ain't no grave That could hold his body down And when I hear that trumpet sound I'm gonna rise up out of the ground Cause there ain't no grave that can hold his body down That can hold his body down My friends, I invite you to the celebration of the Lord's Supper this morning, to the Lord's table. And if you're at home, I invite you to find your communion elements and be ready to partake when we get to that point. As you know, on the night of his arrest, our Lord Jesus took bread. After giving thanks to God, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, in the same manner, our Lord took a cup and he poured it. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for the remission of sins for many. This do as often as you do it, remembering me. These are God's gifts for the people of God. And as we consider becoming Jesus' disciples day by day, part of it is partaking of him in our hearts and in our minds. So please, find your bread. This is bread of life for you today. And dip it in the cup. This is the cup of salvation. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. It is right to give God thanks and praise. Take and eat. Please join me in prayer. Loving God, we're so thankful for the opportunity to participate in your ministry of salvation for the world, of making whole this planet and the people around us and ourselves so that we might grow in you every day. Thank you, O oh God, for what you have done here at this table and throughout our lives to help us to abide in you, to connect us with the vine. Help us now to stay connected each day and every moment so that we might see what you would have us do and say and how you would have us act so that we can see your glory, your will established on earth as it is in heaven. And as we've taken these elements today and they are with us, abide with us, and we, O oh Lord, seek to abide in you. Hallelujah. Amen. Hi, I'm Susan Kramer with Church and Society Committee at CPC. And hi, I'm Kayla Taylor with Children and Youth at CPC. If you are looking for a way to help children, we have a wonderful opportunity for you. Sandra Arguello is the director of the Children's Cup, an organization in Guameca, Honduras that provides food to about 5,000 children in need and special needs children in 83 schools. Children's Cup hopes to provide safe drinking water to these children, an orphanage, and a nursing home in Guameca. John Kramer and Selden Spencer met Sandra and learned of her humanitarian efforts on their trip to Honduras in January 2020. Our challenge to you over the next week is that every time you have a glass of water, set aside a dime, a quarter, or even a dollar, then at the end of the week, Send that money to CPC with LWW children in the memo line. Then that money will be distributed to the project in Honduras to provide safe drinking water through the Children's Cup organization. Thank you again for your support of the Living Waters for the World projects CPC has been involved with in Honduras. 
The Children's Cup appreciates any financial support that you are able to provide to help children obtain clean, safe drinking water. Thank you. The charge and benediction today come to us from the letter of the Colossians. Whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. My friends, as you go out into the world today, look around, ask, what needs to be done? What can I do? Am I waiting for somebody else to do it? If you abide in me and my words abide in you, says Jesus, then apart from me, you can do nothing. But with me, you can do everything. What will Jesus have you and I do today? Let's surprise ourselves and wonder as we take one step, the further steps that God may lead us in taking. Whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to the Creator through Him. Go out today, my friends, and serve the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Hallelujah. Amen.